a glass to the past And the ladies cross the ages Fallen fathers from the motherland Whose lives are on the pages And the father said it best When he told us all the world's a stage So fellas, grab a glass And lift your spirits to the seventh age Welcome one and all to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time once again to pour up a glass and pull up a chair as we gather together here in our favorite corner of the Cross Time Pub, sailing the seas of time and collecting the occasional gold doubloon that might have graced a pirate's pocket at one time. Joining me as always are my cohorts and comrades, Jason Pentrail and James Waldo. Gentlemen, how are we doing tonight? Fantastic. How are you? I'm living the dream one day at a time. Somebody's dream at very least. Or as my old friend John Anderson, my mentor in radio, used to say, It's just another day in paradise, and I certainly feel like that with my Pacifico right here, cold and fresh, newly cracked bottle of cervezas. James, what are you drinking over there, pal? Well, I'm trying to keep the calories down, So, uh, and I don't mind admitting to the world I'm drinking a Cura's Light. It's good, though. It's good. And and honestly, I'm just happy to be here tonight because you guys know I've had that internet trouble lately, so... uh, you know, don't we all? Don't we all? <laughs> yeah, completely crapped out on me the other night and just kind of made me an unhappy camper, I think. Well, that does happen from time to time. I know the plight of a podcaster, but I will say this, and maybe the equipment upgrade had something to do with it because I have brought our dear young James to the dark side. He is now a Sith Lord and he is also an owner of a Macintosh. And I personally think you sound and look much better tonight. Well, thanks. I needed all the help I could get, to be honest with you. But I, the MacBook is really fast, and it's it's. Uh, I think I made a good purchase here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They definitely come in handy. Well, we just got to work on Jason. He's the next one to convert. Although, again, a lot of people don't like Macs. A lot of people are like, you know, the problem with a Macintosh is being able to find all the same programs that you use on a PC. Now, me personally, I don't have that problem as much. And usually, if there's a program that you like using on a Windows unit, you can find an equivalent for the Mac that usually works almost identically. Uh, But then again, some of the preferential Mac programs, uh, GarageBand, things like that, a lot of people buy Macs just for those programs. Now, I, of course... Being an old radio guy, I use Adobe Audition. I am a subscriber to the cloud. Boy, I tell you, podcasting, anybody who ever said it doesn't cost anything to podcast, that is not true. (laughs) If you want to sound good and do it well, yeah, you got to pay for it, baby. Hidden costs. Yeah. Well, when you add it up, you know, it's a lot to keep one of these shows going. So, yeah. uh, I'm one of those people that's of the mind. If you're going to do something, you need to do it right. And you're probably going to spend a little bit of money doing it, but it's worth it in the end. Yeah, what's really no, fun. I agree completely. Yeah, absolutely. Which is why I drink Guinness, fellas, which is what I have tonight. <laughs> there you go. That's right. Sticking. Yeah. Well, you know, speaking of Irish beers, I know that we were going to talk about some uh, brewing culture in relation to archaeology before we get to our interview. And yeah, we're going to be talking about the archaeology of piracy tonight. I am so excited for this interview and with a friend of the program, Dr. Charlie Ewan. But James, on the beer front, you have an update about your latest exploits in brewing there at the Waldo estate. Yes, sir. So, uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to tie this into a, an actual news story when I'm, when I'm done with this, but so I, I brewed up a batch of, um, the seven ages dry hour stout last, last weekend. And I, I tweaked the recipe a little bit and added some things and I thought it was going to be really special. So the brewing process, the actual cooking of the beer went pretty well. But when I got down to the to the very last thing, I put it in the fermenter. I've uh, added the yeast to it. I put the lid on the fermenter, and it's got a. And those of you that are familiar with beer brewing know exactly what I'm talking about. There's a there's a port on the top of the uh, on top of the lid on top of the fermenter that you put a little airlock in. So when when the when the beer outgasses and ferments, it lets the air out of the it lets the carbon dioxide out and doesn't let oxygen back in or the, the you know the air in the room or whatever but there's a little grommet in this hole in this port so when i set the uh when i set the uh, uh the airlock down in, i kind of pushed it down in it popped the grommet out and it fell into the beer oh no yeah so i've transferred the beer back and forth a couple of times between a couple of fermenters and tried to catch this thing this little rubber grommet now everything was sanitized but i couldn't find it and the grommet is in the bottom of the fermenter somewhere. I don't know if it's going to foul the beer up or not. But uh, 
that's just sort of how it goes when, with these things. So, and you won't know, you know, until a, a month goes by and the beer's gone through its process. Now it did, the yeast did activate and did ferment. I mean, there was active fermentation. There were bubbles coming through the airlock. So I'm like, at least I didn't kill the yeast in the process. So we'll see. But the news story I wanted to talk about was one about why human beings love coffee and beer. So the idea was originally the thought was, is because our genetics uh, influence how our taste buds interact with whatever it is we eat and drink. So that that's a, we like it because it tastes good or we like the way it tastes. Well, turns out that's wrong. <clears throat> now it is a genetic thing that, that influences it, but basically it's how our genetics interact with the psychoactive properties of the substance. So we don't drink it because we like the way it tastes. We drink it because we like the way it makes us feel. Hmm. That's interesting, isn't so it? You're, so we're the people that like coffee and or beer or whatever it is you like to drink, you're genetically predisposed to it because you like the feeling of that. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. You know, I was going to throw it to Jason for his story next, but I mean, since you're talking about beer, maybe I'll just get one in there really quickly and then I can do my other story later because there was a article at Popular Science recently along these lines, and they title it appropriately, Archaeologists Unearth More Evidence That When a Civilization Drinks Together, It Stays Together. And this idea is probably familiar to a lot of folks out there because there is evidence that suggests, at very least, that as cultures begin to brew alcoholic beverages, you know, the social lubricant that alcohol can tend to be, this may have actually been conducive to certain cultural advancements that occurred, especially in the ancient world. Popular science reporting on this, they say the Wari Empire, an ancient Peruvian civilization that predated the Inca, made advances in agriculture, art, architecture, and warfare. And they say they also drank a ton of beer. According to archaeologists, Wari breweries, largely managed by women, played a major role in spreading the empire's influence across diverse communities throughout Peru during its height between 450 and 1000 CE. Now that, to me, is just incredible. Ryan Williams, by the way, who's an archaeologist with the Field Museum in Chicago, he chimed in on this. He said, we're trying to understand how the Wari civilization sustained itself for so long. And he says that at their peak, the Wari controlled a strip of land in modern-day Peru between the Andes Mountains and the Pacific Coast, which stretched the same length as the distance between, for instance, Jacksonville, Florida, and New York City. Fairly good little stretch of land there. And although the empire collapsed before European colonizers arrived in South America, they said that they had an early influence on the development of the Inca. And so the Wari people, they say, never had contact with Europeans. They didn't have their own written language. And so much of what we know about them comes from archaeological records. And Williams says it wasn't until 1950 that we were able to identify the Wari capital city, but now they've excavated an awful lot more and over a much larger scope of land. They say up to hundreds of miles away from the Wari capital. And they say that one thing has stood out in all of these locations they have excavated, or at very least most of them. They say breweries are just about everywhere. So throughout the Wari Empire, they say that one of the most consistent features that they have found was their breweries. They say it's a classic case of bringing people together through drinking and merriment, but scaled up way up. Because according to a paper that they just published in the journal Sustainability, Williams and his team says that they were interested in how the Wari created a unique culture around beer to unify otherwise disparate groups of people throughout their territory. So in other words, since they are so widespread, the potential for their being fighting amongst different peoples in different regions they think was curbed somewhat by the introduction of a prevalent alcohol culture. Now that to me is fascinating. Yeah, well, it almost seems like alcohol works on both sides, right? Sometimes it brings us together, and sometimes it causes conflict. I guess it's all in how you do it. It's yeah. all in moderation. That's right. Well, you know, Asheville, where I am, is one of the Beer City USA locations. I say one of because while here in Asheville, everyone says we are Beer City USA, uh, Portland, Oregon has also been uh, competing with us back and forth. Every other year or so, I think we throw it back and forth to see who actually is Beer City. We may have finally won out, though. Because as Jason knows, I've taken him to Sierra Nevada Brewery right here in Asheville, actually just outside of Asheville and Mills River. And uh, one of our city council women was talking recently about this because there's this big debate about renaming our civic center here in town. And you guys will appreciate this on a program like Seven Ages. Uh, the idea is that they want to rename it with something that is uh, more mindful for Native American culture in this region. 
And so, and actually, very soon, Jason and I are going to be making a bit of a field trip to the Cherokee Reservation here in Western North Carolina. So I'm really excited to get back out there. And with that in mind, one suggestion for the name of the Civic Center is to call it the Harrah's Civic Center or Harrah's Event Center. Now, Harrah's, of course, is the name of the casino out on the reservation, but some people are concerned that that will make a connection with gambling because that's where the casino is rather than with the heritage and the culture of the region. But an interesting thing came up during the debate about this, guys, where the councilwoman was asking about all of the different cultural staples of this region. And as she was doing this Q&A, one of the things that came up was, well, isn't beer also a part of your culture up there? And she says, yes, Asheville is a beer city. It is known for beer and brewing. That doesn't mean that we're a drinking culture. And people were kind of laughing because, I mean, how do you have a town where beer is a part of your culture and brewing is a prevalent aspect of our economy and everything else and people wouldn't be drinking beer, right? I get it. She was trying to say, no, they aren't a bunch of drunkards up there in Asheville. But to me, again, I think it's definitely something that although some people are kind of wary of the stigmatization of alcohol being imbibed by a group of people and it being a part of their culture, you know, if you look back through history... Most people, I think, see it in a positive light in the sense that it has been beneficial in the promotion of growth of society, you know, and harmony between people in different parts of the world. So to me, I actually look at the continuation of that here in Asheville, Beer City, USA, as a good thing, not as that negative stigma sometimes that alcohol carries. And I'm glad to see that archaeology seems to be indicating similar things about the ways that people interacted with one another in the ancient world, too. Yeah, you know, I think that's... That's primarily an American uh, mindset to have that the kind of that stigma. I think it comes from our puritanical roots as a you know as a, the original colonies. If you go to Europe and you know a lot of other places in the world, there is no stigma about drinking beer or, or alcohol. It's it's an ingrained part of the culture and it's something that's celebrated. So you know we got what we got here, I guess. Oh, yeah. I mean, think about all of the European, you know, you have Italian wine, French champagne, uh, British ales, Belgian ales. I mean, it goes on and on and on. It seems to be a part of most cultures. But Micah, I think it's interesting that you started off your story talking about Peru. Uh, Let me ask you guys this. Have you ever had llama face stew? No, and I hope I never do. (laughs) Yeah, well, I got to say this is a first for me, too. So uh, writing for Forbes.com, Christina Kilgrove, who's an archaeologist and writer and just happens to be on our guest list. So if you're listening, Christina, shoot me an email and we can make this thing happen. But she writes an article called Pot Full of Llama Face Stew Under a House in Ancient Peru. And in this article, we talk about um, what seems to be a possibly ceremonial or ritualistic offering that was found under this house. Uh, So reading directly from the article, it says an archaeologist working at the site along the north coast of Peru recently discovered a cooking pot carefully buried under a house floor. The simple, well-used pot contains portions of a llama's face, as well as a mismatch of other ingredients that may have been chosen for what they represented rather than how they tasted. So this pot was discovered uh, at what's known as Wasi Huachuma, a site dating between 600 and 850 A.D., Uh, During this period of history, uh, we're looking at increased urbanization, we're seeing irrigation, other changes uh, with the Moche culture, who we've talked about on the show before, Mm -hmm. um, who are also known for their their highly artistic uh, renderings of different pottery and things like that. Um, A very fascinating culture. But the pot was found by archaeologist Guy Duke of the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, who published his analysis in the Cambridge Archaeological Journal. Uh, Its shape, he noted, was similar to those found elsewhere during that time period throughout Peru. Uh, This was often used for boiling and brewing corn beer and stews. So again, uh, we didn't really plan it this evening, but it seems that we've definitely run across a a culinary theme for tonight's show. Uh, Continuing with this story, it says the pot was not a new one. Duke saw evidence of burning on the outside and inside that suggested it had been used previously. Uh, The contents of the pot were surprising, however. Duke reports that he found bones from domestic animals in the pot, including guinea pig, llama, Hmm. uh, that had most likely been raised locally. Additionally, he found maize, common beans, squash, potato, chili pepper, along with crabs, flathead mullet, and even the plant coca. So to quote directly from the uh, article, it says, 
quote, while the method of cooking was simple, add ingredients plus water to the pot, heat to boil, Duke says understanding how and whether to apply particular knowledge was dependent on the material. For example, butchering the llama to extract the jaw piece requires different skills than cleaning a deep sea fish or preparing potatoes and squash. Even more importantly, most of the stew's ingredients had ritual significance based on what archaeologists know about that culture. Camelids like llamas produced wool, they were eaten, and were also ritually important. Maize or corn figures, they would make those into different cultural iconography. Fish were sometimes burial offerings as well. So what we see there is sort of a collection of all things that may have been important during that culture. Uh, but because the stew pot was buried underneath the house and purposely marked by a stone, Duke surmises that the vessel and its contents were a dedicatory offering of some sort. Wow. He explains that this deposit in this location was purposeful, intentional, and laden with meaning. Each element of it was chosen from an array of materials that were available, some from the local field, some from the sea, some from areas much further afield. Though not necessarily any less familiar, the materials assembled in this deposit neatly bundled together. Uh, they represented the various geographic and environmental regions that were accessed by this culture. So it's interesting that we see something that was essentially almost like gathering all of the regional um, parts and pieces and then putting them all together in one a location to kind of signify or represent maybe a region or who knows, you know, these type of things could even be used as uh, a treaty or uh, an offering to a particular God or something like that. But needless to say, to be able to find something in that condition with all of those elements present, I think it's a very unique situation. And uh, again, it sets up uh, another fascinating aspect of all these different cultures that we find in Peru. That is certainly true. You know, I'm so fascinated by all the aspects of archaeology. And what's kind of funny is it's well known that people always have this idea if they aren't archaeologists. And we aren't. You know, we're avocationalists. But we do spend a lot of time with archaeologists in the field, talking with archaeologists and reading and studying about it independently. And I think by now, guys, we have a pretty good idea of the archaeological process and what archaeology is and what it is not. And that idea of archaeology being... Indiana Jones. You know, many hold on to that romanticized view of what archaeology is. And so they think that when you're going out and you're looking for evidence of ancient cultures and their way of life and their practices, their beliefs and things like that, many people, I guess, presume that you're looking for things like arrowheads or projectile points or pottery, or you're looking for, you know, bejeweled items, things that may have incredible value due not only to their antiquity, but also the the aesthetic aspect of them. But what a lot of people don't know is that one way we learn an awful lot about ancient cultures is by studying those things they leave behind which are not of aesthetic value, at least not to people of modern times. Now, there are nonetheless things that were produced by ancient humans, and yes, of course, I am talking about feces. And I want to reference an article from National Geographic. And although this was from late April, we haven't had a chance to talk about it yet, so I think it's entirely relevant here. They say, analyzing coprolites, the preserved poop of people is dirty, stinky work. Oh, how funny. I guess that's the pretty obvious joke, huh? But uh, they say every once in a while, it reveals something truly surprising. And in the case of a new paper in the Journal of Archaeological Science, that startling something was the fang of a venomous snake which appears to have been digested by a person and left in a rock shelter in what is now Texas about 1,500 years ago. Now, this discovery was found by Eleanor Sonderman, uh, who found it as part of her graduate work at Texas A&M University, arguably one of the very best archaeological schools in the country. And apparently Eleanor wasn't looking for that particular needle in a haystack of prehistoric feces. Rather, she wanted to learn more about the indigenous people who used the Conejo Shelter which is located in the lower Pecos Canyonlands of Texas. And apparently the shelter became an archaeological dig in the 1960s before a dam project inundated the area with water. Well, caves in the area had plenty of remarkably preserved ancient artifacts, they said. And these included sandals that were left behind, also baskets that were woven from plant fiber. But National Geographic reports that the most valuable scientific data may have come as a surprise to non-archaeologists, because they say, again, it is the feces, the coprolites, 
And this according to Tim Riley, who is, don't laugh, a coprolite expert and also curator of Utah State University Eastern's Prehistoric Museum. And he wasn't involved with this research, but again, as he explains, coprolites contain a wealth of information. And this is true. You learn an awful lot about ancient cultures, everything from what they ate to what kinds of parasites may have been afflicting them. They can reveal more about the health of the person who deposited them, and the food remnants inside are direct evidence of what these ancient peoples ate. And arguably, there's no better way to learn how people interacted with their environments. They say scales, bones, and yes, the fang of a venomous snake was found in one sample. And this is definitely raising some questions. Now, according to Sonderman, she says pretty much everything else in that coprolite sample was fairly normal for that region. But the fang was so weird, she said, that we knew we had to explore what could be going on. Now, I mean, one thing that I'd kind of wondered about had been, you know, as we know in archaeology, you can have redeposition where artifacts are moved from one layer of stratigraphy to another as a result of burrowing animals, things like that. And I almost wondered, I mean, could it have been that this this venomous snake's fang had been artificially deposited in this pile of human excrement? But what they say here is that the fang's hollow center helped the team ID the unlucky snake as a member of the Viperidae family, most likely a western diamondback rattlesnake or copperhead, both of which are common in the region. And of course, there were scales found in this sample as well, so they know that the entire snake, or at very least most of it, seems to have been consumed. So the idea of redeposition of a venomous fang into this, into this coprolite seems highly unlikely. They also say that there weren't any char marks on the scales, and that does suggest it was eaten without having been cooked. And they say the sheer number of scales suggests the animal was indeed eaten whole. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to go on the record here and say... That the person who ate this, this snake, did it on a bet. Uh, you know, that thought crossed my mind. I was like, yeah, this must have been a bet or something like that. Now, mm. the archaeological interpretation is indeed different. They say it's impossible really to know exactly what was going on, so they delved into the tradition, you know, into the mythology of the people of that area. They said that they found that snakes were rarely consumed except in cases of dietary stress, and even then, they were usually prepared and cooked without bones, heads, or fangs. And they say even though snake remains have been found in other coprolites from the Conejo Shelter, none of them seem to have come from a venomous species. So that brings us to the art of the region. Rock art from the same area features snake-like motifs that they do think were probably uh, supernatural gatekeepers, that they were used in shamanic rituals. And this is definitely a motif you see in other cultures of Mesoamerica and the American Southwest. According to Carolyn Boyd, who's a rock art expert in the area, she believes that this art could represent visions common to those who have consumed peyote and other mind-altering substances. But coming back to why somebody would consume a snake, that's a far cry from consuming peyote or a mind-altering substance. They say it could be that the fang is evidence of a shamanic ritual. Sonderman's research team proposes that the snake was eaten for a distinctly ceremonial or ritualistic purpose, although there's no way to tell for sure. Now... Although I respect that determination because why else would somebody eat an entire rattlesnake whole? This is kind of problematic to me in the sense that archaeologists so often, when they can't explain something, fall back on the crutch of ritual. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking about that. We were talking about that. It's like everything is like explained by religion. And, you know, sometimes I think it's it's important to sort of do, uh, I guess the best word for it is a reality check. Because people are people. And, you know, if you've done a lot of traveling and been to other countries or, or you know, been around. You've eaten a lot of snakes are, whole then. Yeah, you eat a lot of snakes when you do that. <laughs> no, not really. But, I mean, it's completely plausible, like I said, that somebody did this on a bet. Or, as you were, you know, as you were talking about, you know, hallucinogenics or maybe somebody just got high and ate a snake. Oh, God. But why would you get high and eat a rattlesnake? You because know, you were high. Well, my You got high because you wanted to get high. Then you got high. And then you ate a rattlesnake. What? And you're probably sorry later, too. <laughs> One more interpretation that I would offer here is it could also have been, since they already infer that typically snakes weren't eaten anyway unless there was a illness or there was a ritual need for it, what if this person had been suffering from some sort of an illness and this had been a prescribed medication? Now, of course, I doubt it would be a very effective medication, but again, to consume a rattlesnake whole could also serve that kind of purpose in a culture whose beliefs saw significance and perhaps strength in that animal. 
as a sort of totem. And so that, to me, might be another interpretation. And so it's not in any way to try and call into question the interpretation of experienced archaeologists who are out there in the field and are far better equipped to try and interpret the meaning behind a discovery like this than we are. But I do also worry about archaeologists so often finding things that fall out of step with what is expected, and therefore this is probably a ritual item of some kind. You do see that a lot. And I, I spoke mm-hmm. out, and I was in Utah last year, and I spoke with a fellow who was an anthropologist, and he even brought that up. He said there's a great book that kind of pokes fun at all that because he said so many anthropologists interpret things that they don't understand as being what well, must have been a ritual item. So who knows? I mean, I'm sure that that is a valid interpretation, but as we have raised conjectures here during this conversation, maybe there are other interpretations worthy of their salt as well. And I I can only hope that that guy who actually consumed the snake used a little salt to something at least to improve the flavor of a venomous reptile being consumed in mass. That's quite a story indeed. Arguably one of the most unusual culinary archaeological discoveries we've ever discussed on this program. And we endeavor to bring you guys interesting news like that on the podcast. If you enjoy the program, do head over to sevenages.org. Check out the articles, the videos we link there, and other content. And, of course, you can always send along a donation if you would like to further our efforts. There's a button right there which will link you to our PayPal page, and you can donate to the cause. That actually helps fund our research. And many of you guys out there have already done it. We always appreciate that. And this month, we have Christina Frawley at the $10 subscription level who sent along a donation to help further our efforts, our field research, the travel, and, of course, the effort that goes into trying to document archaeology for the new media era. So that's what we are all about here at Seven Ages. We appreciate you guys who support that work. And don't forget about our YouTube channel where you can find all of our podcasts And from time to time, some additional imagery and other goodies to accompany those podcasts. James Waldo manages a lot of our YouTube and uploads the episodes and actually featured some photographs from our time at White Pond uh, for that episode. So if you check out our Legends from White Pond Lodge episode, the last one that we did, uh, you'll get to see some photographs from our time there in the field enjoying the company of fine southeastern archaeologists. So definitely check that out. And of course, we're up to like, what, 18,000 views, I think, now on our topper video. Right, guys? Yeah. Yeah, getting there quick. So it's uh, continuing to grow. Remember, uh, you know, sharing these things, letting other people know about them is vital to the show. Don't forget, we need rates and reviews. And I just want to give a quick shout out because we've gotten three brand new five star reviews and ratings on uh, Apple Podcasts. So big thanks to Octobro, Connor and Ethnosynologist all for taking the time to write us a little review and leave us a five star review. It's greatly appreciated. So, yeah. And on the YouTube channel, folks, I spent a lot of time putting those videos up. If you if you like uh, if you like what you see, subscribe to the channel. Um, it it actually makes me feel pretty good when people watch the videos. <laughs> well, and of course, it helps us get the word out about what we do. If you subscribe and share those videos, so definitely check us out there on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and of course, podcatching clients where all fine podcasts are heard. So. When we come back after this, we will be joined by a friend of ours from East Carolina University, Dr. Charlie Ewan. He's a historical archaeologist, and he's going to be talking with us about something that I am extremely excited to hear about, the archaeology of piracy, next when we return on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Charles Ewan received his Ph.D. at the University of Florida in 1987 and began working for the Bureau of Archaeological Research in Tallahassee. There he participated with the excavation of Hernando de Soto's winter encampment, after which he relocated and ran the Arkansas Archaeological Survey for a number of years. 
1994, he came to East Carolina University, where he is currently a professor and director of the Phelps Archaeological Laboratory. Now, Dr. Ewan's research interests focus on historical archaeology, although he has worked at and studied everything from prehistoric villages to Civil War fortifications and 20th century homesteads. And he's directed projects at Tryon Palace Historic Sites and Gardens in New Bern, Fort Macon State Park, as well as Hope Plantation, Somerset Place, and a long-term archaeological study of historic Bath, North Carolina. Now, we met Dr. Ewan for the first time at an uh, artifact show in North Carolina, at which time he joined us on the microphone for a short segment, and I think we've all been looking forward to having an opportunity for a lengthier discussion with you. So welcome back to the Seven Ages Audio Journal, Charlie. Glad to be here, guys. Yeah, it's good to have you here. You know, you have written several uh, books. You've also been an editor and a co-editor of a number, but there's one title that you contributed to that I think uh, would really stand out even to those who aren't of the archaeological persuasion. And that's X Marks the Spot, The Archaeology of Piracy. Uh, and you uh, co-edited this with Russell Skoranek. Now, that book is available on Amazon. And prior to that, you and Russell co-authored uh, some other literature about this. But with this book in mind, the co-edited anthology, uh, it may sound like a silly question for someone who lives in North Carolina, but what drew you to piracy and the historic period where pirates were sailing off our coast? Actually, North Carolina had very little to do with it. Oh. Um, uh, I, I have known Russ, my, my co-author and co-editor on, on other stuff, my whole life, pretty much. Um, uh, we just sat down and figured it out. It's, it's, it's almost 50 years we've known each other and best man at each other's wedding and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And um, one of the, the things that, uh, I've, I've always liked when I, since I was a child, uh, I, I liked pirates. And when I was five, I got a, um, uh, a record album, uh, William Bendix sings and tells famous pirate stories. And I still have that album. Oh, wow. And as a matter of fact, in grad school, when Russ and I roomed together, um, I happened to pull it out and it was great when I was five it was great when I was 25 after a few beers. Uh, <laughs> and who knew, who knew that, uh, you know, a few years later, uh, when Russ and I were both professionals, uh, we were at a, a conference, the Society for Historical Archaeology conference. And the, uh, we were in the book room and the editor at Florida Press, Meredith Babb, said, Charlie, I hear you like pirates. And I said, well, yeah. And she goes, I want you to do a book on the archaeology of piracy. And I went, oh, okay. You know, one of the things that, that I've learned is when you're asked to publish something, always say yes, no matter what it is. You can always <laughs> figure it out at some point. And I thought, gosh, you know, what am I going to do? Uh, I, I know something about pirates, but I, I, how much pirate archaeology is there? So I, I, I got up with Russ and I said, uh, the Florida Press has asked me to do this. I said, what do you know? I said, I, I know the Queen Anne's Revenge had just been discovered. And I said, so I know something about that. I can maybe get up with those guys. And Russ thought of a couple. And then that reminded me of a couple. And we went back and forth. And by the end of the evening, we'd come up with about, oh, five or six different projects that we were going to get in touch with. Um, Port Royal in, in Jamaica and, and um, some things off of uh, the, the coast of Africa. And over the next couple of weeks, we, we were able to, to find a couple more get a hold of those people. And I, I, I said at this time, I said, Russ, you know, you need to be the co-editor on this thing since you, you're you contributing so much. And, and I was a little hesitant about that because we'd been best friends forever. And this was either going to go well or end our friendship. As <laughs> co-authoring sometimes does, but it did. It worked fine. And um, and the rest, as they say, is history. The, the book did very well. Uh, as far as academics books goes. And uh, then we did another, we were asked to do another one, uh, which was um, Pieces of Eight, more Archaeology of Piracy. Uh, there's a third one kind of in in the thought process right now. And so that's kind of how I got it. Just, it just so happened that when I started actually publishing on Pirates, I was new at East Carolina University, home of the Fighting Pirates. Yeah. And... Uh, there's a, a long history of piracy on the east coast of North Carolina. So it just seemed to work out right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, with X marks the spot, uh, one of the reviews I read of the book actually said that rather than being so much the final word, it's almost the first word in the sense that there had been so little in the way of archaeology applied to this subject 
uh, prior to your involvement with it. Now, I would have to ask, there are some great books that give historical accounts of piracy. Alexander X. Gwamelin's Buccaneers of the Americas, Charles Johnson's General History of the Pirates. Uh, how does the archaeological side of this either correlate with or differ from the existing literature on this subject? Well, I think you use the word literature correctly. Um, Exquamelon seems to be pretty good. Uh, this Alexander Exquamelon, who was pressed into service with, with piracy, and he's relating his experiences. But Charles Johnson, that, that's a little different. It's contemporary, yet we're not quite sure who Charles Johnson is. Is it Daniel Defoe? Is it Nathaniel <laughs> Mist? It's a, it's a pseudonym um, for sure. And we're not quite sure how much of what he's putting into that book is accurate. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of histories of piracy that go through a lot of different documents of the uh, uh, contemporary documents of the time and um, kind of a historical look at it. But I think ours was one of the first really just archaeologies of piracy. So looking at the material culture, and like all historical archaeology, you're, it's just another data set. You know, we're trying to get at what was life like as a pirate? Um, well, let's look and see what, what sort of stuff they had, uh, what their ships were like, what, how did they differ from a merchant ship or a naval vessel? Um, and it, it turns out, unless you have a good historical record to go with your shipwreck, it is really hard to, and that's one of the things we've been trying to do is, and my students now, my graduate students, one of them did her thesis on trying to determine, is there a pirate pattern that when you find an, uh, an unnamed wreck that you don't have any documentation for, can you tell what kind of vessel it is just from the material on it? And it turns out it's, it's not very easy to do that. Right. Uh, yeah, I figured. And, it and without a scorecard, it's hard to tell whether they're a pirate or not. Absolutely. That's one of the many challenges. You know, we met you at an archaeology show. And, of course, when you go to these, the, actually, I should say it was a show that was featuring a lot of collections from collectors and people who are selling and trading some artifacts, too. And, of course, there's always been a historically contentious relationship between professional archaeologists and collectors. And one of the issues with, as I've read up on, you know, the archaeology of studying the pirate history and, and the movements and the, and the entire culture. In fact, some refer to it as a culture of fear that was in response to characters like Blackbeard, who we're about to get into in a, you know, within a moment. Uh, one of the responses I see to this is that they say that in order for pirate archaeology to be done, it almost requires working with treasure hunters and people who may be legally going out and recovering things. But again, many archaeologists, like with collecting, they say, is that ethical? And so is that a challenge with pirate archaeology to have to work with essentially uh, professional collectors and treasure hunters in order to be able to get access to information about this very oh, sensitive oh, subject? It, it absolutely is. And, and just to kind of clarify to, <laughs> for my colleagues why I was at that Artifact Collector show, I was teaching a course in public archaeology at the time, right. and I had my students. I said, look, there's an artifact collection show at a local hotel. I want you guys to all go out. I want you to see what the collectors are like. Uh, and, and there's a vast range. You know, Some are, are in it for the money. Some really love the artifacts. Mm -hmm. um, underwater treasure hunters, uh, they may have an interest in the history and, and such. They all profess to. But they're really in it for the money. Yeah. Uh, and so, and I will say, my underwater colleagues, I've done some underwater archaeology, but I'm mostly a land guy. Um, but uh, uh, underwater archaeologists and treasure hunters do not mix at all. No. They're the, I mean, there's no collaboration or anything like that. In fact, that was a, a huge problem when we put the book together. Two of the uh, um, shipwrecks that were pirate ships, the Widda, which went down off Cape Cod, and the Queen Anne's Revenge were both discovered by treasure hunters. Yeah. And none of the artifacts have been sold. They're all still, the collections are all still together. In fact, the, the Queen Anne's Revenge is being excavated by the state. The, the treasure hunters still have a hand in it, um, but the state's doing all the work and publishing and such like that. The Widda, uh, they had to have professional archaeologists on their projects, but um, th that one didn't go quite as well for, for the archaeologists. And, and, and basically, with the Widow, every archaeologist that worked on that project, because they had to because of the law, their careers really suffered for it. Mm. And um, 
some of them have you know managed to survive it, but it the ethics of that is is difficult, and the and the editor of of our book said. Gosh, Charlie, how are you gonna? How, how are you and Russ gonna deal with this? Because you know I'm I'm bound to take some flack, and I just we we had to write in the preface what treasure hunting and an archaeology this whole question we just discussed, and how none of the materials we uh, talk about in the in the book were sold. There's the collections are all still together, um, and and of course we don't condone the trafficking of artifacts. Uh, at all so but yeah it was it, it was certainly an issue we had to deal with yeah see i thought we'd get the hard question out of the way early <laughs> <laughs> and again you know dr uh, randy daniel was also at the uh, same right. event where we met you again it was quite clear that the east carolina archaeological contingency that was there on pre uh, on site at that event uh, you guys are doing exactly what academics do and obviously we see that it's a very fine line one must walk but nonetheless data can be gleaned and that's what you guys yeah. have to try and do while walking that line you know not condoning or endorsing or i guess the other term that people worry about is the legitimization of collecting right. in that capacity so but anyway when we talk about piracy in relation to archaeology again something i'm sure everybody's going to probably want to know about is the discussion of blackbeard yeah okay well, you know, it, it goes back to what we're talking about right now. We mentioned money. We mentioned collections. And that's what piracy essentially is. We've got guys out there working under the different flags, working for different uh, intentions, different companies sometimes, all with the end goal of monetary you know, uh, accreditation, getting things together, making money, uh, building a name for themselves as they do it. And uh, I'm from Charleston, South Carolina, so piracy is a big part of my history, a big part of growing up, um, my very first book I purchased was Blackbeard the Pirate by Robert E. Lee. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've had that book. I still have the original copy here. But that I've got set, a copy somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it set into mind for me at that early age as I could walk down to the battery and visualize these pirate ships and, and all of the things that happened there in my hometown of Charleston. Um, it began to... Uh, strike the imagination of who were these people and specifically who is this character of Blackbeard that we always seem to hear the most about. You hear about other pirates like Steed Bonnet and, and various other characters, but it's always coming back for the Southeast to Blackbeard. So to start there, we, we realize that name is known internationally, but what most people may not know is the actual name that we attach to Blackbeard, which some call Edward Teach, others say Edward Thatch, and then I think there's about six other spellings of that last name. So let's begin there. Uh, what do we actually know about the person, the character, if you will, of Blackbeard? Uh, what's his origins, and how did he end up here as a pirate off the coast of North and South Carolina? Excellent question, and I will counter that by saying Blackbeard is one of the most famous people that we almost know nothing about. Uh, we're not even sure of his name. We're not sure where he was born. Um, the only really good historical records that we have, and even they aren't in 100% agreement on, for example, his ship, how many cannons does it have? Well, some say f it could hold 40. Others say it had 36. Others say, well, it was some somewhere north of 24. Uh, so, I mean, and, and these are records of the time. Uh, we really only have good records about Blackbeard during the last year and a half of his life. What we know about the early part is all from Charles Johnson's General History of Pirates. And as I said there, we're not even sure who Charles Johnson was. Uh, so is his stuff accurate? Eh, it's hard to say. And even he is a, a equivocal as to where Blackbeard was born. Uh, one edition of his History of Pirates said he was a Bristol-born uh, man. And so he was from England. Okay. Well, later on, it's like, well, maybe Jamaica. And, and since then, uh, a, a graduate student whose committee I was on, Bayless Brooks, he's written a book, uh, done research, that says, yes, he is from Jamaica, and he was the son of a British naval captain, uh, so, and a respectable guy until he wasn't. And there's a local North Carolinian author, uh, Kevin Duffus, who says he's from Bath, North Carolina, and in fact, his name was Edward Beard, and the Beard family is on you know, Bath Creek across from the town of Bath. And, um, and in his book, Last Days of Blackbeard the Pirate, uh, Kevin 
builds a case for saying no he's, he's sort of edward black uh beard um uh from that family uh, I, i'm liking the jamaica thing pretty well and um uh but as far as it, edward thatch edward beard i don't know uh in, in the historical records of the time some variant of thatch or teach but you have to you know, remember, in the 18th century, spelling was phonetic, and you can have the same person's name spelled a couple of different ways in the same paragraph. Right. So. Yeah, that's that's pretty interesting. You in, know, in in the name Blackbeard obviously is iconic, and it's it's very unique. But you know, I got to thinking about it earlier today, and I wondered where, how did he get the name Blackbeard? Did he call himself that? Did his did his crew call him that? Was it something that came later on? Was you know kind of woven into the legend after the fact or, or what? I, you know, it, it, it appears in some of the, uh, well, it, it doesn't really appear much in the historical record. It's Charles Johnson, really, who uh, gives Blackbeard his name and his reputation. Uh, yeah. And and I'm sure if, if and I, I don't have any reason to believe that it, it wasn't, you know, called that at the time, that he would have uh, encouraged that. One of the things about being a pirate uh, is that when you sailed up, you didn't want to have to fight with whoever you were trying to rob. You didn't want to shoot holes in the ship you were trying to take and the cargo and sink it. So what you wanted to do was have a scary reputation, sail up in your, in your ship bristling with cannon and have them just give up, which is apparently what happened a lot of the time. <laughs> Well, that makes perfect sense. And, you know, we, we get into this Charles Johnson character, and I'm beginning to think we should maybe do an episode about him because he's yes. as important to the story of Blackbeard as, as the pirate himself. Um, but, again, it's Charles Johnson that we look back to who kind of describes the early stages of Blackbeard's career basically coming up in the world of piracy. And that leads us to the conversation of one Benjamin Hornigold, who Johnson portrays as um, – Blackbeard being a protege of this particular person. So what do we know about this early relationship, and how, do, how does Hornigold seem to influence Blackbeard in the career that would come? Well, also, according to Johnson, Blackbeard starts out during Queen Anne's War as a privateer, and then after the war finishes, he, like so many, aren't done attacking ships, and the only difference between being a, a privateer and a, and a pirate is is who you're attacking and who you have letter uh, you know an official sanction by. Um, you know, once England stopped all hostilities, well, then his his letter of mark was invalid. Uh, but he wasn't like I said, he wasn't done. Apparently, he was sailing with Hornigold for a while, and why they part company is is unclear. And but it seems that about the time that he takes uh, Le Concorde, which he turns into his flagship, the Queen Anne's Revenge, uh, they had parted company. And was he a protege? Was he a, a fellow captain? Uh, the, le the, the, the record's a bit sketchy on that. Very good. So, well, continuing on that, that path, if you will, um, Based off a, a letter that we see uh, that comes to light from Matthew Munson on July 5th, 1717, it states that Blackbeard and company had become an independent endeavor by this point. So whatever influence he had with Hornigold earlier seems to have you know, parted at this point. Right. And in the autumn of 1717, um, some say, again, we refer to this Charles Johnson character who kind of describes that Blackbeard at this point may still be under the influence of Hornigold. But by that time, we begin to see this independence grow. So is there a certain point or time in history where we can safely assume that those two have parted ways? Certainly by 1717, uh, Blackbeard is on his own. He's sailing with uh, another um, interesting guy, Steed Bonnet, the gentleman pirate. Interesting, right now I'm in the field doing archaeology at Brunswick Town, and this was Steed Bonnet's uh, stop at Southport, which is a town right next to Brunswick Town, uh, claims Steed Bonnet as, as their own. Uh, I don't know why they do that. He's probably the most pathetic pirate I <laughs> yeah. know of. Uh, but anyways, um, he's sailing with Blackbeard and being taken advantage of uh, by Blackbeard. Blackbeard's got a couple of sloops, uh, and at one point... Uh, anywhere between three and 700 
pirates under his command. Can we talk briefly also uh, about that relationship between Blackbeard and Steve Bonnet? Just because, again, here's this guy who seems to be, Bonnet that is, more swept up in, I think, the romance of being a pirate, right? And he's he's got the money, and he can fund the effort, and he can hire a bunch of the town drunkards to come be his crew. But after a while at sea, they're pretty uh, quick to pick up on the fact that uh, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. And there's right. and there's damn near a mutiny that occurs uh, at around that time. If memory serves, Blackbeard kind of intervenes, doesn't he? And I think that you'd refer to it as you know he's kind of taking advantage of Steed. What was going on there? Well, um, they're, they're sailing in consort, and um, it, it's clear that uh, Steed doesn't really know what he's doing or have control of his his crew. And I mean, he bought his his ship. What pirate does that? And um, hired a crew and Blackbeard has him come over on the Queen Anne's revenge with him and puts one of his own people commanding Bonnet's ship. So Bonnet, and, and, and as I understand it, as time goes by, he periodically goes back and, and takes command of his own ship, but he's always sort of in, in, in thrall with Blackbeard. They, they part ways for a bit and then they come back together. But um, whenever they are together, there's, there's no doubt who's, who's uh, in charge. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that leads to you know a perfect segue because by November of 1717, Blackbeard and company they're heading down the north or down the coast to no- of North America to the Caribbean. So we see him starting to branch out. He's moving further south. Um, and speaking of Steed Bonnet and his ship, at this time it appears that Blackbeard is in charge of Steed Bonnet's ship, the Revenge. Um, from what I understand, it boasted 12 guns. Um, and was, you know, a fairly formidable ship within itself. But that's when they encounter the La Concorde, uh, which plays a key role in the whole story of Blackbeard. So describe to us that encounter with that ship and how that began to shape uh, the next part or the next stage of Blackbeard's career. Well, La Concorde uh, starts off, is built to be a privateer, and it does one privateering voyage. Um, and then it's converted into a slave ship, and it has two successful slaving voyages uh, from France to the west coast of Africa and then uh, over to uh, the Caribbean, to the, the Lesser Antilles. And then on its third slaving voyage uh, off of uh, Martinique, it is um, captured by, or, well, it, it runs into Blackbeard, who, uh, and, and uh, Blackbeard's got uh, two ships, and uh, apparently this last, this third slaving voyage wasn't going well. Uh, the Middle Passage was extra terrible. Uh, 61 slaves had died, 16 of the crew, the French crew had died, and so when Blackbeard shows up, they, they just pretty much give up. Blackbeard takes that ship and makes it his own and gives the... Uh, and this, I always found this kind of curious, but he gives the uh, the, the French slavers uh, one of his other ships in exchange. And maybe he just didn't want all the ships, but he, so he's got the um, the Le Concorde, which he ne- renames Queen Anne's Revenge, gives his other uh, sloop to um, uh, the uh, the French, who rename it the Mauvais Rencontre, or the Bad Encounter, and the French actually get many of the slaves uh, are allowed to retain them and they, they sail on and we, we have the deposition of, of what's going on there. Uh, Blackbeard then takes this uh, slave ship it, and, and stuffs it with cannons, um, uh, perhaps as many as 40 cannon. Um, slave ships make pretty good pirate ships. They're, they're roomy and they're fast. And so they're kind of your, your mothership type of deal. And so he, he then sets out um, to uh, go up the east coast of, of uh, North America. And um, which one, I, I forget which one of you guys are from Charleston. Yep. Uh, That's he, me. Yeah, <laughs> Jason. He, uh, <laughs> Jason. Yeah, he, uh, he uh, besieges Charleston with all his ships, which, which was no small feat. And um, holds it for ransom, uh, taking ships, going in and out of the harbor, uh, gets a ransom from the people of Charleston, uh, certainly a, a chest of medicine, but no doubt a lot of other monies as well, and then continues on up to uh, North Carolina 
and that's where um, he runs the Queen Anne's Revenge aground. Oh. And that's sort of the end of the, of the ship. So I guess I'm enamored with names tonight. I, I don't know what's going on with me, but why did they name it the Queen Anne's Revenge? Well, it, it might have been uh, sort of um, how uh, a sarcastic nod to uh, – um, after the Queen Anne's War, that he was a uh, um, uh, a privateer in, you know, a, a play on that, perhaps. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And you know, in, in a brief aside here, I just want to I want to back up to the taking of Lock and Cord and turning it into Queen Anne's Revenge for a moment, because uh, we may have to um, speculate about this a bit, but pirate psychology, if you will. Uh, so many times we think we have these things figured out. We we uh, give certain attributes to historical figures and we think, well, this is just the way it was because this is how we envision it. But that's a good example right there. So he wasn't necessarily, you know, murdering everybody on the ship and destroying things. He was actually assisting people, um, helping some others in order to um, not just completely maroon them, but give them some sort of, of uh payback, if you will, benefit. He didn't just leave them high and dry or just kill them as we often envision pirates doing. So what can we glean from the truth about piracy as far as the psychology that surrounds it? Was it always as violent and always as, you know, swashbuckling, if you will, as people mostly describe it? Well, you gotta, you gotta get out of the, the, uh, the movie mindset, which is it, it, almost impossible to do. Right. Um, but, uh, we don't have any records of Blackbeard actually killing anyone. Right. Um, probably till the, the, the final fight uh, where he's, he's captured, or he's not captured, but where his crew is captured and he's killed off the coast of Ocracoke. Um, so uh, it doesn't mean he didn't kill anybody in between there, but, uh, you know, it's, it's this reputation that he, that he needed uh, and he wanted to be scary. But I think... If you look at it as an economic enterprise, um, you know maybe it was it was just easier to take what he needed and and not go about killing everybody afterwards. To um, uh, I mean, why cover your trail? Everybody knows what you're doing, uh, and you just take what you need. And perhaps if he needed all three ships, I'm sure he would have kept them. But if he didn't, he'd say, okay, well take it off and 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 was he going to go sell this this cargo of, of slaves we don't have any record of him really doing that uh so um it, it, it's curious as you say it's the reality i i think is is an enterprise that uh, uh, uh an illegal enterprise but certainly one that is is based on on making money well, absolutely. I was going to say, this is literally organized crime in the late 1700s. And mm -hmm. one of the issues with it because of that, and this I'm sure is is troubling for you as a historical archaeologist, uh, Dr. Ewan, because one of the trademarks, I guess, of the activities of pirates, and coming back to Jason's point about getting into the mind of or the psychology of the pirate, is the fact that they seem to work intentionally to conceal knowledge of their activities, hence not leaving a whole lot to the historic record. And uh, that's one of the reasons I'm so interested in the archaeological side of this, because uh, we are afforded at this time perhaps a unique opportunity to kind of learn about some of these things. And like you, you know, point out, there's no record of actual murders or deaths attributed to Blackbeard uh, at the eventual final battle. You might say that, you know, at least from his perspective, he would have seen that as self-defense. Uh, you right. know, even when there's the famous, you know, siege there at Charleston and he's taking captives, you know, he's he's not demanding, you know, money so much, I guess, as he probably was uh, asking for medical supplies and equipment, if memory serves. And oh, he was getting money, too. Okay. I mean, there was no doubt that he was he was doing <laughs> that as well. Um, but and, and but and, and a lot's made of that, um, uh, of the chest of medicines that he needed. Um uh, but once again, we're getting kind of a spotty coverage of that. He's clearly terrifying people, and he's keeping commerce from going in and out of this major port. Uh, so uh, I, I'm sure he's he's not above using violence if, if that was needed. But if it's not, it's probably easier and cheaper not to do that. Uh, why not just terrify people and have them give you uh, what you want. Sure. Well, I mean, taking hostages will do that. Now, you said that there's much made of him asking for medical supplies. Do you feel like there's a mythologization of that or that that's been played up more in the literature, perhaps? 
Uh, I, I, I think it receives a lot of interest because it's like, well, what's going on? Are his pirates sick? You know, what does he need the medicines for? You know, one of the things that pirates did when they took ships is they took things like med. In fact, so oftentimes they took the, uh, the ship's surgeon and had them come on board. Uh, piracy, actually sailing at that time of any kind was dangerous work. So you would want medicines, you would want uh, medical people. Uh, they, they took charts, they took charting instruments, they, you know, whatever was useful, they, they took those things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, as we're kind of getting into the realm of discussing the Queen Anne's Revenge, of course, there is the wreckage. You have referred to that as the wreckage. I believe actually that there were syringes and some medical supplies retrieved right. from that, so that at least jibes mm -hmm. with the historical account of asking for medical supplies and whatnot. Do you feel that that is indeed the wreckage? And let's talk about the archaeological evidence that supports that. Okay, that, and that's an excellent question because it, much was made of its discovery, and the the state was always very careful about saying the alleged. Uh, Queen Anne's Revenge, the, ship believed, the shipwreck believed to be that of the Queen Anne's Revenge. But, of course, the press just ran with it and said, well, we've got the, the, the Queen Anne's Revenge and the pirate ship, and, and it was all a big thing until a couple of colleagues of mine in the Maritime Studies Program at East Carolina wrote a, um, an article that basically said, eh, not so fast. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it could be something else. We may be jumping the gun here. And then the press... You know, some of them called me and said, well, what's going on here? You've been calling it. And I said, no, no, wait a second. We've, we've always said we sort of believed that it was. Uh, but, you know, we, we're always kind of, like all archaeologists do, you, you can't definitively say these things. Uh, and that's just usually as good as it gets in archaeology. The press doesn't really understand that and thought there was a cover-up. and But it turned out to be a really good thing in that, the state then invested more time and effort. They, they were about to kind of wrap it up after sampling this wreck. And they said, well, we better see what else we can find. And over the next few years, recovered enough uh, information so that uh, the project director, Mark Wild Ramsing, and I wrote an article um, uh, in Historical Archaeology, the journal, where we, uh, beyond reasonable doubt, where we say, you know, it's, there's little else that it could be. Mm. Uh, it's the right size ship, dates to the right period. There are no other historically accounted for shipwrecks in that area at that time of that size and that armament. And so I feel pretty good about calling it the Queen Anne's Revenge. Yeah, process of elimination, if nothing else, yeah. would, would seem to indicate that, which, again, is very historic. And yet again, also, it was found by a private group. This was, what was, this, what was the group called? They were the Interstall, uh, Intersal. Inter Intersal Inc., right, yeah. And, you know, they gave this account, by the way, at their website. The shipwreck of Blackbeard, the pirate ship Queen Anne's Revenge, was discovered by Intersall Inc. on November 21st, 1996 at Beaufort Inlet, North Carolina. Initial excavation and recovery efforts during 1997 provided overwhelming evidence that it was indeed Blackbeard's flagship which had been found. They said there were 14 cannons that were located that first season. Many were six-pound shot cannon, too big for smaller vessels, they say. Uh, two of the cannons were raised and began undergoing long conservation processes. But again, you know, when you've got all those identifiers there, it does seem to make a pretty good case that this was indeed the Queen Anne's Revenge. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's the historical record. Lindley Butler, a uh, historian from North Carolina, did... Uh, a lot of looking at the uh, shipping going in and out of uh, Beaufort Inlet, and there was nothing that even approached the size and armament of the Queen Anne's Revenge till the end of the 18th century thereabouts, uh, and certainly none of them sank there. So uh, I believe by now, I think there's 24 cannon that have been, I, I, I think, 20 have been recovered, 20, some more have been uh, identified. I'm, all, I'm a little sketchy on exactly. I, I know it's over 20 that uh, have, have been recovered. And, um, and, and so, and there's more still down there to, to come up off the bottom. And all the artifacts date to before 70, 1718. So uh, it's, it, it, it looks pretty good to us. Yeah. So, when the when the ship ran aground, either intentionally or unintentionally, on the sandbar, did they afterwards did they scuttle the ship, or did they just leave it where it was at and it eventually sank, or what happened? How, how did it go down? 
Well, it runs aground, and I think, you know, and that's one of the good things about running aground. It's not like uh, the, the pirate ship Witta. That went down in a storm and just scattered everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, this ran aground, and so uh, the pirates were able to get just about everything of value that was portable off of it. In fact, that's what Blackbeard does. Uh, takes bonnet ship and, and goes to Bath, North Carolina, to take the, the king's pardon. Um so uh, the ship was out. It's, it's well, standing on the shore, if you knew where to look, uh, just out by what's now Fort Macon, you can, you can see it. Uh, it's several hundred yards out there. Uh, I'm sure that it just sort of broke apart after a while. Uh, did they go, did the, the local vill- villagers go out and salvage some stuff off it? Uh, perhaps, but getting heavy things like cannons and, and things off of it would have been difficult. And a lot of the cannons that had been found look like they weren't even mounted; that they had been left. They'd already been they'd been put in the hold for mm. use at a later time. Oh, okay, mm. backups maybe. Yeah, yeah. No. interesting. So, as far as the artifacts go and the actual excavation, where do we stand on how much has been taken off, how much remains, and what's the projected? Uh, time period for the future? Uh, that is a good question. Um, over half of it has been uh, brought up and is now undergoing conservation at the uh, Queen Anne's Revenge Conservation Lab on uh, ECU's West Research Campus. Uh, it's a state-of-the-art lab. It's, it's really an excellent uh, facility. And uh, the folks out there, despite the uh, the somewhat iffy funding that comes from the state. Um, right now, they've got a they've got a, a good crew there, and they're and they're working on uh, conserving the stuff that's been brought up. When when is they've gone out and, and dove on the ship recently just to assess its condition? Uh, there's been a couple of hurricanes that have gone through Florence, for example, uh, last year. It seems to be pretty good, uh, pretty stable where it's at um, for the moment. And uh, when they're going to be able to mount um, another expedition to, to get the rest of it out, uh, I'm not sure. Um, it's all going to depend on state funding, and, and we're in election year now, so oh, yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> <we're gonna see. laughs> but they, they have put a, a bunch of money towards the uh, conservation lab. And so, yeah. uh, and, and honestly, they've got enough pulled up now to keep them busy for the next couple of decades. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, that's something I I do want to focus on for a moment is the lab itself. So uh, everything I've seen online, everything I've been able to read about it, it, like you said, it it seems to be very state of the art. And um, a lot of interest seems to be buzzing around that particular lab. So what exactly are they doing as far as conservation or research methods at the lab itself? And is it available for public view? It is. It is available. Um, uh, it's you got to know where you're going. It's uh, it's just as I said, it's, it's west of town. Our west, we've got this small research campus off the main campus, uh, and it's they've got a couple of uh, big open houses, one in the fall, one in the spring, and it's wide open to the public. And they put out displays, and they have all kinds of different things going on, and, and they encourage kids and such to come out. Uh, I believe uh, the first. Saturday of each month is also, uh, you can book a tour to come out and, and see what's going on there. So there's plenty of opportunities. I, of course, since I, I teach stuff and I'm the liaison for the, uh, it's a state lab on university property, which makes it kind of interesting trying to manage it, uh, trying to get those two bureaucracies to work with one another is stretch me <laughs> to the limit i'll tell you that uh but um i take my students out there the maritime studies program their students work out there i've got uh, a couple that are doing um internships or uh thesis projects out there uh so it's it's been great for my students and great for uh you know a lot of other ecu students and, and the public does have, you know, a, a lot of good opportunities and, and there's a traveling exhibit and the main exhibit, once these things are conserved, they go down to the Maritime Museum in Beaufort, uh, North Carolina. And uh, that, that is a very nice exhibit down there. Yeah, guys, we should make a field trip and come visit the lab. Is oh, it open to the public? 
Uh, the lab? Yeah. Uh, like I said, uh, on the first Saturdays. Oh, okay. of, um But if you let me know ahead of time, we'll see what we can do. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah we'd love yeah. to come down and visit. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm often on the campus of ECU as it's only about 35 minutes from where I live. So, uh, yeah, I'll definitely be making my way out there. And, and Mike is sure. here in town very often. So, yeah. yeah, we'll certainly make that happen for sure. Charlie, in your book, particularly the final part of the second section where you co-authored with Russell uh, and you looked at the victims of piracy in the Spanish Caribbean uh, and what is referred to in that portion of the book as the culture of fear that was built around those activities. Can we talk about that in relation to the legacy of the pirates during this pivotal historical period? Well, the the Spanish in the Caribbean and, you know, I... Part of, I, I think they get kind of a bad rap, still part of, I guess, the black legend that, that it persists to this day. You get the idea that the Spaniards were just these hapless buffoons that were constantly having their gold taken from them by pirates, by the British, by the French, by the Portuguese, by you know anyone who wanted it. Um, and they were almost powerless to stop them. And in fact, you get that certainly from the, the Hollywood movies. They're always just these clowns and the pirates have their way with them. And we all cheer for the pirates, of course, and, and hate the Spanish. Um, the, everybody, Spain, Spain was basically taking the wealth of the, uh, the New World and transferring it back to itself. They were, in the, uh, the 16th century and the 17th century, really the superpower of, of the world. Yeah. And, and to pursue all their, their uh, ambitions, they, they needed this wealth. And, and so a lot of other folks who, you know, were trying to get in on it were finding it easier to prey on the Spanish shipping than to go establish a, a colony and mine it themselves. Um, and Spain started doing what every country does whose shipping is beleaguered, and they start sailing in convoys. And these are the treasure fleets. And honestly, it's very successful. Almost all of it makes it back to Spain, but the times that it doesn't, wow, that's big time. Uh, um, Henry Morgan uh, scores big. Uh, Sir Francis Drake scores big. Um, and these, uh, Morgan is a pirate, but but Drake was a privateer, and he was going after you know Spanish uh, wealth for England because uh, England and Spain didn't get along for a lot of the, that that time period. Um, Spain, though, because they were being attacked, uh, their major uh, ports at, at Puerto Rico and in, in Cuba and in, in Central America had large fortresses built, these uh, castillos uh, that, that we can see and visit today. So it, this was all part of, I mean, we, we did the same thing during World War II. We, we sailed in convoys, you know, so that the the, the German U-boats uh, wouldn't, wouldn't sink everything. And, um, and we were, you know, eventually pretty successful with that. And, and Spain, like I said, more, more of it gets through than, than doesn't. Uh, so, um, but what we see, what's visible, is the reaction to piracy and just general aggression from these other European powers who want in on the new world wealth. Yeah. Again, such a fascinating and pivotal period there in history. So much going on. And of course, those pirates, uh, although often more legendary, I think, than history actually affords us in terms of what they were really like, uh, they are also one of those portions that really, truly captures the public imagination. So it's really been great to be able to talk to a historical archaeologist who is, I think, truly helping to write that history and how much of it has been left out about these historical figures. So thank you for your time, and thank you for being our guest again. This is technically your second appearance here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. So, Charlie, we hope to get you back for round three, maybe talk about the Lost Colony a bit. Okay, and, and let me finish with one, if we're going to keep with the, the, the whole business of, of piracy and, and things. Yeah. Because um, piracy flourishes where there is no uh, strong government. And... Um, when you see the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise, who are the bad guys in the Pirates of the Caribbean? It's the British West India Company mm -hmm. or the East India Company. And, um, and that's who is really the evil people in the movie pulling the strings. And that's really fairly true because you don't get the governments involved until the merchants say, you know, we're losing a lot of shipping here and that's going to cut into the tax base. And the governments go, why, that's terrible. 
you bet we need to take care of that. And that's when and that's that's what brings the golden age of piracy, the end of the 17th and early 18th century. That's what brings it to a close in the Caribbean is that uh, the British government saw that it was losing too much revenue and they made peace with Spain and then they cracked down on the pirates. So yeah. anyways, but yeah. yes, no, that's, you know, it's follow the money. <laughs> it's how, <laughs> how, it, how it works. And yeah. As I said before, it is really, really hard to get past the romance of piracy. Um, but if you want to know what the pirates of the Caribbean were really like, look off the coast of Somalia now. It's, I think they were a miserable lot uh, for the most part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that would make perfect sense. And, you know, Dr. Ewan, before we wrap it up, i got to get your comments on one last thing. All right. We can't let this one slip through the cracks. <laughs> so on March 20th, you received the National Society Daughters of the American Revolution History Award Medal. And according to the uh, Society's website, this medal is given to an individual or group whose study and promotion of some aspect of American history on the regional or national level has significantly advanced the understanding of America's past. So final word, please give us your thoughts on receiving such a prestigious award. Well, it was, a, it was a big surprise, and uh, it, it was nice. I, I I wear it all the time now. In fact, uh, <laughs> I, I'd show it to you, but it's on my pajamas right now. Uh, so, no, it, it was it was very nice and uh, unexpected. And I think those things mostly go to historians. And so, as a, as an archaeologist, I was I was doubly flattered to to receive that. And uh, <laughs> I'm surprised you guys know about that. But uh, anyways, it, it was it was a nice thing. And uh, maybe uh, if you hang around long enough eventually you, you, you start to get some of these things absolutely well i would actually chalk that up entirely to talent so once again it's always our <laughs> honor privilege and pleasure to talk with you charlie it certainly won't be the last time okay thank you guys i i, I look forward to our next discussion Thanks again to Dr. Charlie Ewan for coming on the show and talking to us about Blackbeard. What a super interesting subject. So to wrap up the night here, I, I want to kind of recap. So we've talked about beer. We've talked about human poop, coprolites, people eating snakes, and Blackbeard the pirate. So I think after all of that, I think I'm, I think I hear last call. You guys hear last call? Yes, I'm ready. yes, I <laughs> do. My last one and get We out need here. something to wash this down, and hopefully, it won't be any any more of that wonderful North Carolina salt water. So, again, <laughs> thanks to Dr. Charlie Ewan uh, for his many insights into this fascinating subject, and thanks to you guys, my fellow Episcopalians, as James Waldo would say, because there's an old saying many Episcopalians know well: wherever three or four are gathered together, you will find a fifth. And that's always the case here in the Cross Time Pub. So thanks to you guys. Thanks to all of you out there who follow our work and share it online out there. You guys mean as much to us as our study of the ancient past. So head over to sevenages.org. Make sure that you follow our work. Keep up to date. And if you'd like to reach out to one of us, please send along an email. Micah, James, or Jason. We certainly love hearing from you almost as much as we love ponying up right there, traveling back in time as we empty our glasses at the Seven Ages Cross Time Pub. So guys... Let's follow James, who's already making his way over to the bar. James Waldo, Jason Pentrail, and yours truly, I am Micah Hanks. It is the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Mm-hmm.